Shabbat Shalom, my friends. Two spoiler alerts. One, at the present moment, I have COVID and a touch of pneumonia. So in the middle or at the beginning, at the end, somewhere during the recording, if I have to stop and pop cough drops so I can continue talking, I beg your understanding. Second spoiler alert. The doldrums on the Jewish calendar that began with the ending of Hanukkah, continuing to this day with one brief interruption for Tu B'Shvat, of course, all that is coming to an end. The month of Adar is now upon us. Purim arrives March 7th, and one month after that uh, is Passover. It's time to start building those shopping lists. Okay, our sedra is Truma, beginning with Exodus 25, verse 1 and following. A Truma is an offering, something which is lifted up toward God. Those of us who went to Hebrew school are familiar with the teacher saying, Laharim et Tayad, lift your hand, shut your mouth, lift your hand. Uh, the Israelites were directed to lift up trumots, to bring trumot, to bring to God specific kinds of gifts that would support the building of a wilderness sanctuary. At this point, we're not even going to hint at an eternally nagging question. How would the escapees, who not that long ago were slaves in Egypt, have in their L.L. Bean or Tumi backpacks, gold, silver, copper, fine yarns and linen, and an abundance of aromatic spices and precious gems. The rabbis, trust me, had a plethora of fly, fine answers, and we're going to leave all of that for them. So, <coughs> What was to be done with those materials? Vasuli mikdash v'shachanti betocham. God says, beginning of our sedra, make for me a sanctuary so that I might dwell among them. So once God had finished the acts of revelation at Sinai, the people were to be engaged in, what, a massive building project. The Torah loves building projects. Pause. Can you think of several building projects in the Torah? Okay. Everyone came up with Noah and the ark. Good. Well, what about the descendants of Adam and Eve deciding to build a huge ziggurat, a massive tower reaching up to and penetrating into heaven so as to contest the sovereignty of God. And also, smaller projects, we are to build Sukkot, those little booths, every year, the Festival of Tabernacles. Maybe all of this explains why so many Jews in the mid-20th century entered the construction industry. It's something that Jews do. I loved to build things as a kid. Most of us probably did. We had a rector set. I went to look at Amazon today. You can buy vintage rector sets designed for kids in the STEAM, S-T-A-M, STEAM programs. You had to have a reason now to build. I guess that the word vintage can apply to several of us as well. Do you remember Tinker Toys? Named in part after a gentleman whose name was Gordon Tinker. And of course there are the ubiquitous Lego systems found in amusement parks, art galleries, museums, and in our homes where we trip over them with regularity. But building is not just for kids. Aesthetics is a primary feature of architecture. Acknowledging 
that a building must be attuned to design, beauty, function, materials, proportion, durability, and much, much more. We humans don't just build. We build so as to express our individual and communal understandings of beauty and to give expression to our yearning to survive beyond the moment. And Rand famously grasped so much of these truths in her impactful novel, remember the name? The Fountainhead. Over time, Moses and his construction team to be headed by but Salel would build the tabernacle, the inner tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, and the Ark of the Covenant. These structures would be at the very center of the camp. Everything would be arranged around them. Here, the priests would offer sacrifices. Here, Moses would assemble the people. Here, Moses and God would continue their conversations that had begun at Mount Sinai. Our most successful buildings, our most meaningful buildings are successful because they address our needs. They find ways to whisper to our souls. Buildings can do that. What were those needs? One was validation. The Israelites had been to Sinai. They had agreed to accede to revelation. They were not the people they had once been. And these sacred structures now would be a statement to themselves and to others that this is a people that lives in an active relationship with God. Another, another need was to provide an image of permanence and continuity as they worked through a terrifying liminal period during which they actually lived nowhere, belonged nowhere, could call no place their home. We know that during the 40 years in the desert, the Israelites were moving probably no more than two and a half years. But wherever they camped wasn't home. They didn't belong there. They were in a place to which they had come and from which they would leave. But the buildings, the structures, were going with them into the promised land. They symbolized the home, the stability for which they yearned. Another need was to lift up their eyes from the drudgery and the dangers that they encounter in the wilderness. When they saw the flames of the altar, the smoke rising from off of the sacrifices, the way heaven and earth seemed to touch when God's presence filled the tabernacle, they were transfigured. The gold on the sacred implements were like a living flame, inviting people to ride that flame upward above the sandy wasteland to the very presence of God. They believed that the architect of Everything that they saw was God. That Moses, but Salel, were merely replicating fiery models that existed in heaven. One last point. Every item and every aspect of every item that they constructed was devised to embrace a rich symbolism. To see the buildings, the utensils, the implements is to learn about the cosmos. Look carefully. The menorah 
was a living tree. The pattern of construction was a reflection of creation itself. And the Holy of Holies, think about that, was a way to pick up Mount Sinai and to carry it them with them. They would never be out of contact with God. And most importantly, the buildings they built performed the impossible. Somehow, they could contain God. Build me a tabernacle so that I might dwell among them. A limitless, boundaryless God would accept, accept these structures as truma, a pure offering lifted up, and God would therefore never leave their sides. Many of the sanctuaries and tabernacles built by humankind, built by peoples of all faiths and religious understandings, as much as those constructions differ one from the other, they all seek to validate their builders. They provide a sense of permanence and continuity. They lift up people's eyes to a loftier place. And every corner, every window, every wall seeks to teach the lessons of their belief. May all that we build reflect our loftiest dreams and most significant needs. Thanks for sticking with me today. Shabbat Shalom. See you next week. And don't forget, Purim is coming. <laughs>